Hey everybody, this is MC Schrafel coming to you once again from lockdown to carry on our conversation about strength. Last time we were talking about this, we looked at the why and wonderful whys of strength practice. This time we're going to look at some of the what's. The idea is that by looking at these factors, you'll have more knowledge about what your options are as you build a strength practice and be better able to assess any program or what anybody tells you about any program for how well it's going to deliver on any of the qualities that it promises. Before we get into that, let's take a quick look at those whys again, just to give us some context. We saw that why practice strength affects everything from our cognitive capacity in our brains to our overall quality of life and making sure that we live as long as possible, as healthfully as possible. It has antidepressive, anti-dementia, stress-reducing effects, biggie on chronic pain reduction, enhances creativity, body composition, strength itself, which is of course a very good thing, and the complement of strength that we looked at, which is suppleness and overall resilience to make you a better you. So what's in a strength practice? Well, we need to look at some intent of what we'd bring to a strength practice that is required for a strength practice to be truly successful and enjoyable, uh, as well as some of the implements and uh, movement types so you get a good overview of what goes into a strength practice. First off, the goal, the fundamental goal of why people get into strength practice is usually, especially as conditioning for athletes, for example, is to make changes in muscle tissue to be able to better sustain load. Now, if you're working out, getting strong, specifically to have a better day, a better quality of life, that's fantastic because you are improving the capacity with which your body can move you around by affecting these tissue types, the cell types that we've talked about from the mitochondria to the types of muscle fibers that we looked at last time. All excellent. And then another component to this is if we're serious about it, we want to assess it. So is it actually benefiting everything else? How do we find that balance? What kinds of questions do we ask to see, well, are we feeling better? How do we feel in the morning? Are we faster? in terms of our capacity to get through things and have more space to relax uh, because that's part of that suppleness quality. So asking the question, how do we feel regularly within that practice is really important. Let's talk about some of the practice parameters to get those two goals of uh, better overall strength and overall better us. Key tool one is that we need to bring a sense of consistency to the practice. You can pick anything you want to do in terms of a strength practice for the first four to 12 weeks. They're going to have an incredible effect on the nervous system of your body. They'll probably start to show some physical effects, but four to 12 weeks, mainly the body is just getting used to this. And so the important thing about the body being able to begin to adapt positively to strength is to do the reps. It doesn't matter if you pick up a hundred push-up for 30 days challenge or you start lifting real weight or you lift yourself, it doesn't matter. Just do it frequently um, as much as is reasonable within the program. We're going to look at the parameters for that too, but it's important to get in reps consistently for that adaptation to happen to get all those great quality of life benefits. The second thing is when we are practicing to be deliberate about it. A lot of people get really turned off of going to the gym, as it were, because they think it's boring to just pick up and put down stuff. Yeah, it is, but if you bring intent to that to be able to say, what is the skill that I am trying to build here? How do I know that I'm doing this as effectively as possible? What's it affecting inside of me? That's really important. And so we need to be prepared to spend time this is what deliberate practice is about, and this is apparently where the most learning comes, is where we're uncomfortable, the thing that is challenging, to pay attention to it in order to work through what might be uh, holding it back from improvement. For me, it's this movement right here is a regular challenge that I have to bring really good attention to, not to bail on it. And we can talk about what boredom is often is in, in um, Chicksail Mahalia talks about flow, and that we lose flow, that sense of time disappearing and really enjoying being into something when it's either too challenging or not challenging enough. And that's also something to bring to deliberate practice is that sometimes things are not comfortable, we don't get into flow, but by bringing our attention to it and figuring something out about it, we can at least benefit from it, do the hard graft that's necessary to make good improvements. 
If something's a challenge, we need to figure out why. Or let's just say it's a good thing. And a third tool here is, again, assessing are we actually hitting the fibers that we want to get the changes that we want to get that mitochondria buildup, to get that hypertrophic effect in the muscle tissues? And again, that comes from learning about these dimensions as part of our assessment. So how do we feel and how is it going? How do we assess? So in other words, really, assessment is important. Um, and a tool for that is how do we start to be able to debug how well something is going? It's not enough just to learn, I don't think it's enough, just to learn the skills of picking up a kettlebell and putting it overhead, though that's fantastic, but to figure out how the whole body from the sensation of the weight in the hand, the um, reflexive responses of, of what's happening on the other side of the body when this side of the body is lifting, what's the rest of me doing, um, is this connecting into a pattern that, that I am able to predict and use. So for instance, if you move a light weight um, for a bunch of reps, you get very good at understanding the movement pattern, but that doesn't give you the, the insight into how to move a heavier load. That's a different parameter. So how do I start to use these different pathways in my body? What Z Health here in this course that I've been saying, here's it's free, check it out if you're interested in the nervous system, still do that, um, affects movement and what is, you know, affects everything from pain to performance. So I'll just leave that there as, as again, there's a sense of consistency, deliberate practice, assessment, and debugging. Those are the qualities we want to bring into a practice. So let's talk about what are the options in a strength practice? What actually gets moved? Well, there's really only one thing that a strength practice is doing, and that is teaching us how to contract and relax muscles in particular sequences to enable volitional or voluntary movement. The cool thing is most of the time we actually focus on the voluntary movement. I am picking this thing up. I am reaching for my coffee cup. I am moving uh, my body to the floor and pushing it back up again. Yet while we are acting the, on the volitional parts of the movement, the brain and the body is taking care of all the other bits that we're not focused on, the reflexive components to any movement. But it's all about contraction and how to achieve optimal contraction sequences. And there aren't that many kinds to think about. Our movement patterns are either bilateral, they're happening on both sides of the body at once, or they're unilateral, they're happening on one side of the body at once. The only kinds of contractions that there are to think about is uh, eccentric and concentric contractions. And these can happen when a joint, and, and again, the whole thing about muscular movement is about contraction of muscles and muscles attached to joints, and they're meant to move joints. So we're gonna look at two cases of these in a second. And so eccentric um, contractions is when we are holding tension while the muscle lengthens. Concentric is when we're holding tension as the muscle shortens. And it's like the bicep curl here, we're shortening the biceps muscle as we squeeze all those fibers into one place. Or when we lengthen our arm out fully as we see um, in this other, the first diagram here, the front of our arms is, uh, say we're lowering something on a rope, is that the front of our arms don't, don't entirely relax at the bottom of that movement, but they are an extension, and that is an eccentric contraction, or the muscle has lengthened. And I should have said extension is then when the joint is extended, so this person who's showing us the back of their arms, or this model showing us the back of the arms, or the arms fully down, we would say that the elbows are extended here. Yeah, the elbow joint is extended, whereas in the bicep curl beside that, we're seeing the elbow joint is flexed. So we've got flexion, extension, eccentric and concentric about muscle lengthening and shortening, bilateral, unilateral. That's pretty much it. Now the cool thing is those things look like they are happening pretty much in front of the body. Well, the way that muscles are attached, when we get into learning a little bit more, that's getting a little deeper into the muscle work than just the lifts, but what are the muscle attachments? These little red dots show where the biggest muscle in our body, bar one, our butt muscles are bigger. This is for the latissimus dorsi uh, that gives us that winged look in the back. Uh, or have huge number of attachment points running up and down the spine, into the shoulder blade, into the back of our arms. 
uh, to pull our shoulders back down and, and the arm when it's straightened out back down is a great pull-up muscle or rowing muscle. And what's showing beside that is when this muscle is being stretched here, uh, is that we can see that it creates rotation. And when it's contracted, that you get the opposite movement of pulling the shoulder, the spine back, uh, bending at the hips. It's, it's a really complex movement, but this is also where in contraction of the full muscle, we get rotation. So in thinking about movements, it's also, and I should have put in a specific slide, important to think about what are referred to as planes of motion. Are we just moving a weight up and down in front of us in what's called a sagittal plane? Or do we start to move around us into different planes of motion? And what the heck are we moving? Well, one very popular once upon a time strength training approach was called isometric, in which you hold a particular joint angle and you apply tension. And this is either called a yielding or an overcoming isometric. So if you're pushing your hands into a wall and really focusing on the back of your arms, for instance, or your spine area, the muscles there, you would be trying to overcome the wall. And I'll show you an example of its complement in a second. But just so that you can start to connect how learning a little bit about the anatomy of muscles is interesting for being able to build better performance and contractions. Here's an example of classic Arnie Schwarzenegger pose, incredible um, hypertrophy affects the muscle fibers that have grown here. And if you were to right now mirror this pose, and I invite you to do that, put your arm up, your shoulder up, squish your um, uh, forearm as closely to, to your uh, top of your arm as possible, turn that fist in like that, um, and here I'm going to ask you to do something, actually, that Arnie has got a great movement here for contracting what you see as the two heads of the biceps here. This bicep muscle got highlighted. They have two bits that attach to the top of the shoulder. One would bring the arm in front, like the classic curl that you see, bicep curl in the gym. This other one, though, is the attachment goes up over the arm. So that's actually pulling the arm out to the side, sort of the way he has it there, and squishing in to get that contraction in a flexed elbow joint. But I'm going to invite you to do something. Instead of see where he's got his fist turned towards you, placing the camera, well, squish your arm up like that. Now turn your fist the other way. And that's going into what's referred to as supination. If you do that, you actually get a bigger squish on your bicep, but it's not as photogenic to have your fist turned away, I guess, or something. But this is looking at being able to connect what are called the insertion points of the muscle. Here you can see the um, top or long head of the bicep insertion point above the arm and then below in the elbow so that you can get the sense of, oh, it's like a pulley. When I pull this up and squeeze on it, and uh, turn my wrist as the way that's actually turning the forearm uh, muscles here, uh, or bones rather, that, that you get this incredible contraction. And if you hold that, that's an isometric where you're holding the joint angle and you're creating your own tension on that muscle. And in fact, this is the example of the yielding um, isometric in which the person is holding that chin up uh, position and the goal is to hang there as long as possible and not let gravity pull you down. So that's how you're building muscle tension in that piece. So uh, isometrics are the kind of foundation of strength practices, but they're the foundation not just of calisthenics, but also of a lot of gymnastics, uh, whether you're holding this kind of plank position um, gravity free as a, or a lever position or you're hanging out in an iron cross on the rings. There's another isometric uh, movement. This is a huge part of being able to, again, build up muscular strength without needing any tools. It's just you and a chain or a wall or a door frame. There's lots you can do. The more uh, types of movements that most of us are used to when we think about uh, strength training, however, are referred to as isotonic. In other words, you are actually moving the joint with load to create the same kind of hypertrophic response in the body. So an example here is a dynamic movement that we see in Olympic lifting. This is the snatch. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful, fast movement of moving a lot of load uh, from the floor to overhead. And uh, that causes uh, uh, responses in terms of muscle fibers. You can imagine the muscle tissues that it's going to affect to get this speed, power, and explosive strength uh, in this ability to move load 
over joint angles, the complement to the isometric then is the isotonic. Here's another type of isotonic movement that is less focused on the speed and explosiveness, is a slower absolute strength pull like this deadlift from the ground. So these are perhaps the most familiar types of movements that we see when we're thinking about weights, but there are many, many more things that we can move and play with to create strength. In fact, there are more implements probably that I can list here. I'm intrigued by the fact that a cigarette company once was advertising uh, the proper movements for clubs, but clubs were hugely popular in the States. In fact, that first image uh, of the gals working out is, is club swinging. Club bells were huge in uh, 19th century gyms. But also, we have this other thing that's, that's happening that you'll start to see looks very much like old school gyms, is what's called the CrossFit gym, in which we're using things like weights as well for a lot of dynamic movements, but also various kinds of straps, rings, bands, ropes, people climb ropes, the clubs are there too, cables, rowers, all sorts of implements are available that aren't necessarily what you would see in the kind of classic gym at work with the treadmills and, and the um, machines for weights, but more this kind of uh, old school gymnasium type workouts and implements and bands. I have to tell you, this is a fantastic newish implement in the weight room or the gym uh, to facilitate everything from building up pull-up strength to doing rehab to um, doing isometrics. So it's fantastic, these kinds of tools. So it's a huge variety of tools that you can use to do, again, move, eccentric, concentric, extension, flexion. And again, there's only a few ways you can play with these, but they create infinite variety. So the main thing about muscle strength is something called time under tension. And that means how long are you over a session, not just in a single movement, over an entire session, creating tension on the muscle to have that or contraction, really. And there's three ways that these can be varied. It's the, what is the load that you're using to produce that tension? How much total uh, work? How many times are you moving this thing or how long are you holding it? And what's the intensity with which you are moving this load? So, for instance, moving one very, very heavy weight that you can only move one time, what's often referred to as a one rep maximum, is a very much more intense movement than um, picking up a, a bottle of water and curling that 150 times. Um, they will both work muscles, but the intensity, uh, the immediate intensity is different. And by intensity, generally speaking, what we're talking about are the different energy systems that we looked at way back when we were looking at what is going on in the mitochondria in terms of converting energy in, or fuel into energy and going from anaerobic to aerobic. So very, very intense efforts can be anaerobic primarily in nature in terms of their energy source. And the fibers are the fast twitch fibers that will um, be brought into uh, effect for that kind of load. But often you need to get through the slower twitch oxidative fibers to be able to develop that kind of intensity. So again, it starts to sound complex. I'm sorry about that. It's, I don't mean to. It's really just these three parameters of load, volume, and intensity that get combined to create strength programs. And there are as many strength programs as there are coaches, it seems. There are various principles. This is the biggest one that's uh, still kind of... Um, established is what's known as progressive overload. So again, we're plastic, we're constantly adapting. So where we start today with a weight won't be where we're at a month from now with our weight, and that might be, uh, or volume uh, instead of a weight, we might use the same weight, but our volume goes up, or our time in which we complete a set of reps or repetitions of moving that weight, the intensity goes up. Um, some people call compressing the time to do something with a low density, uh, as in escalating density training, or here the German volume training, the 10 sets of 10 reps each, um, which research has actually shown um, you don't get much more out of this than you do if you're doing five reps for 10 sets. Uh, the debates around sets and rep cycle are insane, uh, but you, how you cycle these is also important and interesting. So again, I'm not going into how to do it, but just to expose you to, to the language and the discourse around creating strength training practices and who believes what about just playing with those three variables of load, 
volume and intensity. And there's also the different kinds of mechanisms, and we've touched on these a bit, the high intensity interval training, and now we have a sense of what we mean by intensity, and so that's usually in terms of we'll do something for a particular period at a particular level of, of some type of measure, whether it's, it's not usually heart rate, but what's called uh, our VO2 max level might be involved. Uh, we could talk about how to calculate that another time, so you do um, two to one ratio in terms of action and rest, or one to one ratio of action and rest. You might have heard of something called a Tabata cycle, which is based on uh, uh, a program that was developed for Japanese uh, ice skaters for the Olympics, in which they pedaled their guts out at a particular power uh, level for uh, 20 seconds, rested for 10, did that for eight times in four minutes, and fell off their bikes puking but got really a lot stronger from that. So we've also seen that this, this kind of intensity approach can be very beneficial. Another thing we want to make you aware of is this thing that you're seeing here is putting straps around different parts of the body, and that's called blood flow restriction training, or also starting in Japan called occlusion training, which is fantastic for rehabbing folks. Uh, I won't go into the details of that unless you'd like me to at some point, but it's worth checking out in terms of helping to enhance especially strength recovery for people uh, coming back from an injury. A lot of people are just using it now as part of their practice, but the great thing is it suggests that everybody can move. Um, also, there's these notions of uh, low intensity training. Folks are trying to say it's just as good as, no, it's, it's good, it's great, it's different. And how you use it is different, or uh, in the endurance space running, there's the uh, low intensity steady state running. There's a program called 80-20, which looks at how most of a runner's training should be done at uh, a low intensity and then 20% at a higher intensity, etc. There's lots of this going on. And then within this, we need to build skills. And our uh, skills are how do we move these different loads safely, effectively, so that we can keep coming back to them. How do we load them so that they have an effect? But these are core skills. So what we've been looking at are a whole lot of things, as you can see, that are part of movement practices. Yeah. So um, my, my counsel at this point is consider outsourcing your plan to find a trusted source. I've recommended um, calisthenics movement folks as a trusted source. They're offering us a discount right now to check out their program. I like their home program because it's very well guided and structured. It's got lots of elements of what to eat, how to recover, so on. So everything that we've been looking at in terms of what goes into a movement practice, they're looking at uh, in these programs so that you can outsource this to them, have conversations if you want about any of these variables, uh, but knowing that somebody else that you can trust is taking care of these for you while you build your knowledge and skills so that you don't have to be uh, stymied by not knowing what to do. Uh, what is that called? Analysis paralysis uh, can be overcome while you build up your own experience, while you start to feel what a strength practice is like in order to start to develop your preferences within what works for you. So just suggesting that the URL is here again. Um, and also, just to close out, a couple of notes on strength practice. Every athlete has some kind of strength practice, but we're all athletes in terms of our expertise of, of practicing at something. And to make it easier and better, then we want to um, ensure that we have that foundation. And these great pictures by Howard Schatz show just how strength manifests differently in different bodies for different skills that we might want to apply them to. But the thing is, Everybody has this fundamental conditioning and strength. And one thing I forgot to mention about, uh, it's on one of the slides, is the sense of cycles. And that you don't always have the same level of intensity or body fat or composition throughout the whole year. There are ebbs and flows to everything. And just as a final takeaway, strength is a skill. It is a practice. That's why I don't talk about working out or training. It's a deliberate practice. It's a wonderful practice. It's very rewarding because you do get to build skills knowledge, experience, to tune yourself and to be in tune and be able to move as you wish for as long as you wish, as well as you wish. So 
Um, thank you very much once again. If and as you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Post some comments below this video if you like. And uh, look forward to hearing great stories about your own strength practice. It's a game changer. And uh, start today.